he gave me that image that every newspaper writer, every every, every magazine writer, it's, you gotta feed the beast. And I've never I've never wanted that image, and and I've never let, and it's never gotten out of my head. One of the, uh, the we have a series of sayings in one of the chapters of the chapter hundred book, and, and one of them is one of my favorites is uh, the shortest distance between two points is always up. I'm not trying to be an advocate or or a, a, a wordsmith necessarily. I'm just trying to give them information. Hey, this is Hal Herring with the uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers podcast. Uh, I'm still in Duluth, Minnesota at the Outdoor Writers Association a meeting here. And uh, I got two old school uh, writers and hunters with me. I got Rich Landers from the Spokesman Review. Um, and I've got uh, Pat Ray, who writes for the Corvallis Gazette. Gazette Times. Gazette Times and uh, author of uh, The Chucker Hunter's Companion. And a general all-around feller. Um, so I, one of the things I just wanted to talk about, uh, especially I, I signed, signed up with Rich first on this to just talk about that you've been covering hunting and fishing for as long as I've been reading. You were in diapers when I started. Down. In, exactly. I still yeah. am. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I still use them, and I'm heading for the de- the Depends variety. <laughs> Um, it's the circle of life. It's yeah. circle of life. <laughs> so, uh, but I just, one of the things I noticed on here when, like, whenever I'm researching something for a story, um, and I'm Googling up one, to every every topic has been covered by Rich Landers at some point. And it was noticed that, like, 10, if you go back, say, eight or nine years, you were, uh, like, correct and like many of the columns like pointing out different stuff that came to you know that eventually would come to pass with time so i i was i wanted to get you on this podcast and just see what whither go whither comest and whither goest the hunting and fishing world in the your bailiwick well it's like a lot of things how if you put enough out there you're going to be right certain sooner or later a blind pig finds an acorn every once in a while absolutely did um and so like uh how is it how is it cha- how how has your job changed? Well, it's changed in the course of uh, flow, in the course of uh, what I produce, how much I get out, uh, as opposed to how much I must be in dealing with things. You know, I uh, I had a story that I did. I followed the transition of uh, film uh, outdoor photographers with film to digital. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't think any of them argue that digital is fabulous way mm-hmm. to go. But I do remember interviewing the great John Shaw, the nature photographer. And uh, he was uh, talking about the transition and, and what was good about it, what was bad at that time. And, yeah. and uh, But one of the things he said that I always miss, even when digital photography is 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 the, the, way, the bomb, you know, uh, is that uh, I used to get up and a f- nature photographer, wildlife photographer's job was never – easy you got up early you were out there before daylight you uh, maybe had a little lull in the middle of the day and then you were out there until after dark but when after when the darkness hit you could come home drop your film in a kodak mailer and go have a cocktail the day was over yeah, and now you're going home and going to the can to the computer and, right and you're finishing up and photoshop and and writers the same way you know we have to blog we have to do this we have to be on social media so there's no there's no downtime, uh-huh. uh, or you feel guilty if you do take some. Right. So I would say that's the main thing, just kind of the rush to not do the great depth, in-depth research and file a story and then go on to the next one. You kind of never end. You never, you right. never see a beginning and an end. Do you feel like you have to feed the beast? I or, do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I had Scott McMillian, who runs Montana Quarterly, he gave me that image that every newspaper writer, every every, every magazine writer, it's, you got to feed the beast, and I've never I've never wanted that image, and it, and I've never let, and it's never gotten out of my head, right? You know, no, it's it's true, and and you know I'm getting ready to go on a trip to Duluth, and uh, Mon- uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service says they're going to um, uh, delist grizzly bears in Yellowstone. Right. So I mean, an important news story for my readers. They, right, uh, people are on it, so I'm I'm. Immediately acquiring what I can, and I'm more more or less relaying what's being written with a, with a few comments, and and uh, get that uh, posted 
literally as I'm going to the airport. Right. And so, right. you know, that's the way it, that's the way our world is. They demand it now, and, and right. if you're going to be the person who delivers it, you got to deliver it now. And right. Well, I just um, I'm I'm uh, somewhat behind on my field and stream column right now. You know, the the internet column and um. I have been – one of the things Katie and I were actually talking about yesterday was uh, you, you're you able to do that quickly. And um, I, I lack the confidence to actually put something together in a matter of hours. Um, and so I don't. I, I And then I – and I you know, and I'll, I'll have anxiety over it for a few days. I'll be checking. In fact, checking back. I, I lack that. And, uh, and so that's – when I feed – I'm feeding the beast too, but I'm not feeding him as fast. Yeah, but I appreciate and, reading what you write then because it's thoughtful and it's uh, you know it's it, it's reflected on and you're you're gathering you're making making some research efforts. Um, a lot of times when I put things out so fast, it's more compiling what right. what's going on and getting getting the AP report, getting the what the Natural Resources Defense Council puts out right away, and right. what their comment is, and and just getting it out there for people. I'm not and, and sometimes I'll have a I'll synthesize it a little bit, or sometimes I'll have a commentary to lead it in of my own. But my goal is to inform. Right. I'm not. I'm not trying to be uh, uh, an advocate uh, for anything. Right. It's just the facts. I'm not trying to be an advocate or or a, a, a wordsmith necessarily. I'm just trying to give them information. Right. That's gotcha. that's the immediate stuff. You bet. Is it cut into your hunting and fishing time or uh, hiking? I know you do a lot of different stuff. Definitely has. Yeah. Yeah, I used to be able to pop out uh, of the office, get the things done, and pop out. But now there's lingering things, and right. um, it's harder to get out. But I still make it my lifestyle, or I wouldn't be doing this. Right. Yeah, that's mine, too. I mean, and when I when I add up how much hunting and fishing we actually do, it's a lot. It's a lot it's, more it's than a, a lot of guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not waiting for vacation to do it. Right, right. I've never taken vacation to go hunting. Right. Or fishing. It's always been your that, – that's what you do. <laughs> that's what yeah. I do. So, Pat, have you seen it – have you seen an, uh, not so much in writing and uh, I want to talk about this next, but have you seen an evolution and or devolution or either way? I mean, you've been you've been publishing forever. I've been writing for for a long time. I I think that uh, probably the difference for me has been uh, the difference in outlets. Yeah, and and a lot of the outlets that I used to write for and were dependable outlets are no longer in existence. Right, and and they've gone the way of dinosaurs under the pressure of of digital the digital world or lack of advertising right. or or whatever. But the for a freelancer like me, the impact is is more on a constriction of of outlets. Gotcha. And I I, w- I would say too it's a it's the, there's probably more outlets, but they just don't pay. Oh yeah. And so you yeah. you you're caught in this this you're, that's I mean that for a for a freelancer who's, who's in it you got to make a living. You it's 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 harder then. Although I mean I I came along right at the transition, so I I never really Field and Stream uh, was great in say ninety nine two thousand, and I didn't realize then that was that was already over. <laughs> You know, when I when I stepped into it, um, I can't say that it's been bad for me in the way I, I think when they sent me down to cover the oil spill in 2010, I think we found a whole new world. That's when the conservationist column started, and we were doing that live, and we had embedded video even in 2010 because Tim Romano, the photographer from Colorado, he was he was with me on that, and he was he's just he's a modern guy. He knows how to do stuff, and uh. I don't know that the coverage was all that extraordinary, but it was a lot of fun, and we were, we felt like we were doing something new. And Field and Stream, I think, did too. People really yeah. liked that. Um, well, Field and Stream has pioneered uh, conservation uh, columns in 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 the magazine uh, when I was an intern in wow. Field and Stream in 1975. Wow, in uh, New York City. In New York City, a uh, little oh. Montana boy. I wore my Montana Boy State T-shirt and got a lot of play out of that on the street corners. Yeah, um, but uh, <laughs> I uh, I went and Jack Sampson was the uh, editor then, and they just fired Michael Fromm. Mm-hmm. And I did a. Uh, they he asked me to assess what he thought of Field and Stream coming in. Uh-huh. And so I wrote about that that uh, I felt that it was a mistake and that uh, they fired him because he got uh, he, he he got controversial mm-hmm. and you know 
Uh, Field Street was on Park Avenue, and they were all out about Park Avenue at that time. Yeah. And so I uh, I wrote about that, and it didn't really hit well with Jack Sampson. Um, he didn't uh, appreciate it too much, the criticism. But yeah. uh, it was me, and that was uh, what what I thought. And um, I remember— Well, they uh, asked you. They asked me, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and they, but they did. They hired George Riger after that. Right. And they continued out. They have a kind of a history of it, and uh, a lot of magazines don't. And boy, what is more important to a sportsman? Uh, it's not nearly as important to know how to catch right. uh, fish as a, a steelhead is to preserve it. Here's right. Ted Trueblood, who I edited right. when I was a college wow. kid yeah. and, and an intern, and he, you know, wrote about the good old. Joe stories that everybody wanted to read the yep. uh, hook and bullet stories, but then when it came to dams on the Snake River, and he or lost Dorshack too, right? Dorshack yeah. Dam on the Little North Fork uh, yeah. or on the North of uh, uh, the Clearwater, he uh, he lost, mm -hmm. um, and I think it it haunted him to some degree. So uh -huh. good for those magazines that do it because you know, without conservation, our, our sports are not are done. Right. I was man here yesterday. I was sitting this morning drinking coffee, looking down into Lake Superior. And it's clear, you know, and there's all these people. But we had that great presentation yesterday about cleaning all this up and how it's like completely re changed the it's changed the economy 180 degrees, you know. And and it, the the basis. I mean, I've always that guy yesterday from DNR. He said, you know, what people didn't understand was yes, you could tear everything up and you could get these profits and and extract them literally mine the profits and get all the trees down and get them all in the lake and then get all the iron ore out. But the the losses, the deficits have lasted up until now, and now we're just paying it. Um, what is it, like oh, about 100 years later, um, we're getting, we're paying that, that bill is not going to be paid for a long time, you know. Right. So it was just, a, it was an interesting thing that i mean that guy's that's what he does for a living and it's, he's really got an understanding of of ecology as economy you know um and it's kind i was of neat to, to have seen the, the the successful cleanups though it's uh, there and you know we've done it on the potomac yep uh, the susquehanna in oregon the willamette right the Lake erie Superior. river caught on fire when i was in high school there right <laughs> right that's right so the, when we when we put our minds to it the uh the effort can Oh yeah, we're the we're the best in the world at wrecking it, and the best in the world at fixing it. Um, we can do I, it. I was in Florida just recently, and they're they're the biggest. I think it's the biggest restoration project of its type on the Kissimmee, and they've got to slow the Kissimmee down, put the bins back in it. They they made it straight, and it's taken so much ni uh, nutrients down into Lake Okeechobee that that's that's the 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 root of the problem is that Lake Okeechobee is dammed, but the dam is catching this incredible amount of nutrients off of agriculture and whatnot and they're they're gonna they're restoring the they're putting back the bins that they took out you know and well, that's funny that you <laughs> say that one of the reasons i became that headed me off toward being an outdoor writer was in high school i had a tour i, I grew up in lewistown montana and it has a creek running through it called big spring Creek. oh yeah runs i know right, it runs right through town and it was it, it used to be phenomenal fishing it's still good fishing but um i went on a uh a tour with a biologist, a field trip, and he showed us the straightening of this little of the river to accommodate the Boeing crews that were coming in and had to have a trailer park to put in the Minuteman missiles. Oh and wow! So, so this is not not ancient history. This is sixties. Yeah, and uh, so he took us on a. He showed us the stream, and then he showed us where it was straightened, and then talked about the effects of that on the fishery, on the river and the fishery. And he got a tear in his eye uh -huh. talking about it. And I thought, wow, right. this guy feels... It's for, moved. He is moved, and he feels for his fish. And uh, yeah. I thought, wow, that took me to another level. Yeah. There, now, there's still, there's still some restoration on that creek, right? Uh, there probably always will be. That, yeah. that, those stretches are still... But they're they uh, and since I have grown up and left there, they have put the contours back and, and right. the, the natural stream meandering back into a upper stretch. Right, and, it's and it this creek Pat runs under the bar, 
Can you looking down through that thing and still in there? Yeah, well, they locked it up. You know, when I was a kid, this shows you how kids. <laughs> this shows you how kids have evolved. There's a mint bar, and you can uh, the shrink creek flows right under, and they had a glass uh, window at that time, so you could look down. You could walk in the bar and look down and see the creek. Well, our kids, we would float our inner tubes under that creek. Gotcha. And right under that window, uh, <laughs> and did it all year. And it wasn't until the modern kids, these are kids of the of the 2000 era, had it figured out that they could float under that thing at uh-huh. night or after hours and punch up and get whiskey in the, <laughs> right. in the bar and float on down. Uh, fully equipped. Fully equipped. Those, <laughs> those kids, they got it. Yeah. So they walled it. They they've they walled off the hole. Uh, they haven't walled it off, but they've locked the trap door. <laughs> <laughs> it was a happy time for a little while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <sighs> that's great, man. Well, that's right. And I I remember. Did you you hunted that country, the Lewistown country, growing up? Oh yeah, we had so much good hunting, uh, and it's still good hunting. Yeah, it's just harder to access now. Right. But we had so much good hunting. I never really hunted much of the rest of Montana. I didn't have to. We right. Hunt birds and antelope and elk. Elk camp. We could drive to elk camp. In, in the breaks? In, no, the the breaks was another story because of, you know, uh, the gumbo. So that would limit your access to hunting there. Yeah. We'd go up into the little belts and stuff uh-huh. like that. Had pronghorns right there, uh, 15 minutes from my house. Uh, well. Sharp tails, pheasants. Um, it was pretty much God's country. Yeah. I mean, I started out actually pheasant hunting at Hilger. Yeah. 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 When I went 27 years ago or whatever. And uh, they let somebody just let us go hunting, and it was great hunting. Great hunting. I had a, I had a friend who worked at Rocky Mountain Labs, and he just would he just drive out there and ask. And yeah, that's um, changed now. That part has changed. Unfortunately. There's a lot of lease in there. A lot, a yeah. lot of. It's fantastic hunting. Fantastic. And I, I was trying to remember. You know the ranch that's it's changed now. It was all in block management along the highway going towards Grass Range. Um, I can't. It's not XIT, but it was a. Uh, it was a big, one big block of accessible ground, and it's out of block management now, I'm told. Well, that's too bad. Yeah. I had, um, so did uh, y'all, y'all have elk hunting at Corvallis? You know, we have. It's harder two, to get a tag in Oregon. Well, or, we have fewer elk. Yeah. yeah overall, but uh, we have two different kinds of elk, of course. We have the Roosevelt's in the coast right. range, which are actually larger in body, if smaller in, uh, shorter in, yeah. in uh, antlers. And then from the Cascades east, we have the, the typical Rocky Mountain elk. Yeah. And and I've hunted both. I like hunting both of them. The truth is that uh, the coast range is a pretty hard well, place to hunt. Well, I bet it hunt. is. It's, yeah. It's, the, the mountains aren't high, but they're pretty steep, and right. the vegetation is so thick yeah. that it's difficult. The people that know what they're doing do very, very well. Yeah. The rest of us typically go east. Right, right. And you're in the rain all the time, right? It's kind of like southeast a, Alaska. It's a lot of rain. Yeah. It is. They, you know, when you get close within 30 miles or so of the coast, you're looking at uh, plus 70 up toward 100 inches of rain a year. Right. Wow. That's <laughs> a, yeah, that's all. We get nine where I live. Yeah. yeah. Without the snow, there wouldn't be any people there. Or they'd be nomadic. Um. I was uh, so one of the things I want to ask y'all both. So y'all been covering this as writers and as complete lifestyle hunters and fishermen. So how's it? What's changed in your career as to people hunting and fishing in in Oregon? Say when you first came back to Corvallis, and what year was that? I don't, I don't want to date you, but yeah, no, I don't mind being dated. I'm too old to worry about it. But <laughs> uh, you know, I, I never really actually came back because when I got out of the Marine Corps, I, right. I came to Corvallis for the first time in 1982. And in those days, we were probably at the end of what is typically called the eruption of mule deer. Yep. Okay. So yep. so if you take history back into the late uh 19th century up through 1960s early 70s you know we still had uh in the eastern part of the state uh, uh habitat that was exploding because yeah. we had taken a few million sheep off of the range right gotcha and so that habitat contributed to this eruption of of mule deer which lasted through the 60s or 70s in the 80s people were starting to realize that 
those deer weren't been nearly as as numerous right and the department of fish and wildlife started realizing they had to do something and that's when we first started seeing uh limited entry hunts and uh-huh. well we first started seeing this them is across a, the board the mid 80s yeah 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 and so and were there not as many mature bucks all of a sudden people uh, could see it and absolutely and the the bucks were the mature bucks were smaller yeah we had uh we had gone into what would might de- be described uh as a uh sort of reverse darwinian yeah. pressure selecting for the smaller yeah yeah. yeah yeah we started selecting for the smaller by slicking off the the best yeah and uh, we're still paying that price, although we still see a lot of good bucks in, in yeah. some of the areas where hunting is, is restricted. The same is somewhat true of elk with an added pressure of, uh, of agricultural impact. Right. So as elk numbers increased, uh, the impact on, on the, the farmers yeah. of, of almost every type right. were were increased drastically. They, in turn, put pressure back through political channels to the department. And so, as a result, we've seen a, a lot of uh, cow hunts, a lot of way, a lot of uh, attempts to reduce the, uh, the elk numbers down to sustainable numbers. In, Quote, in, unquote, sustainable. In, in, yeah. in, in balance. You <laughs> yeah. know, when you start talking yeah. about balance with habitat, there's a different... Sort of balance, and that's balance with uh, agriculture. Right, right. Yeah, I was uh, so. Before we get on uh, this, I want to go back and uh, it, you you were a marine helicopter pilot. Yes. And when I first met you, you this may be totally wrong, but we we talked about hunting St. Vincent's Island. Is that correct? In Florida. Yes. Holy smokes! You ever heard this story? No. <laughs> so all right, could you don't if you don't mind, man. I was so I was telling him about this insane place. It's the Nature Conservancy took it over from this very wealthy family. It's a little island, not very little, it's big, off the coast of Apalachicola Bay. And it has samber deer. It had been stocked by, like, one of these, I can't remember the name of the family, but they used it as their own private, like, hunt and preserve. And they had um, samber deer and all kind of exotics. Yeah, and, I don't remember too many of the exotics. The samber deer are... They're as big as elk, right? Like damn near, and, and they, and they <laughs> shock you, right? And so the reason I was telling them is so, and I can tell this story because a hurricane overwashed what was called the oyster pond. Mm-hmm. And when I was in college early, a buddy of mine had seen read in Sports Illustrated the lost bass of this island, and the rumor was only the governor was allowed to fish there. So we took a borrowed Grumman aluminum canoe, paddled it across the inlet there from Indian Pass. Right. Couldn't figure out how to get in there. So we we went up as far as we could and hiked about seven miles, and we got to Oyster Pond. And it was completely surrounded by cattails, and you couldn't get out in it. You couldn't fish it. And we found an old boat. And we, it was a fish and game boat, which, and, uh, we got out there and we started catching fish, but it was in March and they were up in these gator trails. They weren't in the lake really. And a buddy of mine caught, first he caught a nine pound, an eight and a half pounder. And I said, that's a sow bass. You got to let that go. Even back in the day. And he said, my father, his father was a tournament bass fisherman. He said, my dad has been fishing all his life, you know, for fish just like this. And this is, I, I caught this, I'm keeping it. And I said, you let that one go. We got into a heated argument, really. And he's still my be- one of my best friends. And I said, uh, and he said, all right, I'm letting this one go. If I catch another one, I don't want to hear a word, you know. <laughs> and I thought, like, what the odds of that is, you know. And and, and sure as hell, he, he's a great fisherman for one thing. And he put this big plastic worm in this you know, in a bed and nailed this big, it was like nine, it was, it was over nine pounds when we got back seven miles and a canoe ride across, but one of the, the best day of bass fishing in my entire life, it's bar none. Yeah. The, the and biggest so, problem then was, was keeping your, your, uh, crankbait ahead of the gators. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they were everywhere and they were doing some kind of like either territorial or courtship thing. They were fighting. And, and it had these mounds, and um, yeah. and they, it's one place where you could go out on a white sand beach, look at the Gulf of Mexico, and there's gators laying there. It's, it was a cool place. So I was telling him this long story, and Pat goes, "Yes, I've been there." <laughs> and I was, like, and so tell that story if you would. 
Well, I I don't remember it. You mean my story? The story yeah, weren't when you? I was there. Didn't you bow hunt that? Yeah, I did bow hunt. And, yeah, and uh, and I I I went out the first morning. And this is I'm assuming that uh, I made several mistakes that are memorable there. Yeah. Uh, but one of them was I went out the day before the season opened, and I and I set up my deer stand, and then I. And how'd you get out there, a canoe? Yeah, we no, we took a, a power boat from the from Indian Appalach- Pass. Oh, Appalachicola. Yeah, so it's about nine miles across. Yeah, there. <laughs> but if you're doing a canoe, you want to do it across Indian over at Pass, the Indian, yeah, half mile or whatever. But uh, I went out, set up my my tree stand, and then in the morning, in the dark, I I couldn't find it, and so I was standing there in the in the uh, what was what was that palm. Yeah, that palmetto. palmetto, yes, palmetto. It's, com- it's completely intertwined. Like there's places it's, where you can't, you couldn't get through it, and you with can't a dozer. see anything. And I could, I had no idea where I was, <laughs> and so I, I stood there with my bow, and and darned if a, a, a herd of pigs didn't walk up to me, <laughs> <laughs> and I and I shot one from about me to my foot, and uh, and then he tipped over, and and then I shot at another one. I thought I'd I'd gotten him, but I didn't. Uh, and ended up just having to stand there until I got light enough to deal with, <laughs> deal with them. But the palmetto, the the thing about the palmetto was the palmetto birds, mm-hmm. because you'd be there and it'd be quiet and you know a few birds singing out in the background and things. Once in a while you'd hear a gator or something, but but then a palmetto bird would come in at about the speed of heat to hit into these big noisy sawgrass type palmettos and it just explodes with noise scare uh-huh. you to death well so were you stationed down there i was stationed at uh, pensacola i was gotcha. a flight instructor in yeah. pensacola and i remember uh we were talking about some kind of uh a hog nose snake, right? Didn't you run oh, into it? Yeah. that one, yeah. So the hog nose. <laughs> this hog- is a person never. You'd never been in that part of Florida, right? In, in the wild. Well, I I had, but I just didn't. And I'd seen hog nose snakes. Yeah. But I'd never seen a big hog nose snake. Yeah. And and so there, I I I was standing, but getting ready to shoot a nice buck, and he was about forty yards away, and I had an arrow knocked, and then I started hearing somebody breathe. <laughs> and it was a loud breathing, and it was, <laughs> you know, and I, I thought, what the heck is that? But I just kind of ignored it and started to bring my bow up real slow, and and then the breathing got louder and louder, and I went down, looked down at my feet, and there is a snake, and he, he was, you know, three feet, three and a half feet long, and a big old head, and he was, he was expanding in, in, in <laughs> circumference and. And he's raising his head at me, and I was scared spitless. And they get bigger as they engulf your leg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, while so, they're attacking. So the, the, the problem with the hognose snake is they're totally harmless. And but he looked so tough. And and if you tap him, listen, and, listen, it's harmful if he scares you to death. <laughs> yeah. Also, they and, and they they uh they look just they, they're all different color phases. Like we had one in Alabama that was all black. So you yeah. would never know unless you looked at it really closely. Like the, the other color face looks, you know, is multicolored. A lot like a rattler. Yeah, a lot like a, a pygmy rattler, which live all over that island. Yeah, and so the, the when I had seen a hognose snake previously, the instructor I was with said, okay, watch this, and he tapped it on the nose, and the thing rolled over on his back, and they played dead. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> to the, you know, I wanted in the worst way to tap that thing <laughs> and, and just ignore him and shoot the buck. But I was so afraid that I stood there until the buck wandered off, never knowing that I was there. And the snake finally said, what a fool you are. Yeah. Because I, had a de- I had a deal with that buck. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's gonna he was, be, they were working together. He's going to be paying me, paying me for the rest of the year. Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty bad. Yeah. So I was uh so to <laughs> I had I had to I did not I was trying to remember that tale but I was uh so in in so your all your time rich in covering all this like how is the hunting and fishing world that you are immersed in especially in, in covering it too how has it changed not just your personal experience but the, but but the experience you've gathered from other people. Well, I don't think covering it has changed. Um, you still try to get uh, 
the facts and get sides of the issue and and in some cases make an make an argument, but uh, most cases just covering it. So it, it's just that the issues continue to evolve. I mean, um, uh, you know, sage grouse were were so plentiful. Lewis and Clark remarked about it as they went through Washington on the Columbia. Uh -huh. And uh, in my time there, they we, I could hunt them when I first got there, and in the seventies and early eighties, and then uh, they shut it down and there's you know it's all been conservation work to bring them back since then but right on the other hand there was no wild turkeys there when i first came right, and now right. wild turkeys are everywhere um you know we have tremendous uh, wild turkey hunting and so uh there's that ebb and flow and uh the blue mountains when i got there they used to be packed with people on uh opening day of the elk season mm -hmm. and uh but it literally uh, a guy on every ridge and and on every point on every ridge, uh -huh. and now uh, it's not that way because uh, elk herds have had to come down in size to accommodate uh, landowners down below, and um, uh, they have bull. Uh, but now you, your chances of seeing a great big bull are really good. It's just uh -huh. your chances of getting a tag to hunt it are, are lower. Are, are lower. But, yeah. But I think a lot of hunters really like the idea that they can go out there. I had a I can only shoot a spike bull, but I'm got three different six point or better bulls within four thirty yards and that's pretty damn exciting. I bet. And, yeah. Um so I couldn't shoot it but I could really appreciate it. And uh and the problem is you put in for eighteen, twenty years and by the time you get that tag it those hills are really, really <laughs> steep. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> you, you need to breed up a a crew. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. And, and fish, fishing has uh, evolved. You know, the northern pike have become an issue. They they were illegally introduced in Montana. Yeah. Uh, they come downstream into Idaho. Idaho people will uh, embrace them. Uh, but in Washington, they got the cold shoulder, and they're getting the cold shoulder now. We even have a bounty on northern pike because uh -huh. uh, they don't want them in the Columbia system where they're right. going to raise hell with they're, our – They're our, coming down to Clark Fork? They're coming down, yeah, the yeah. Flathead, the Clark Fork, and then into the Ponderay River, and they're up into Canada. Canada's uh, launching and uh, trying to get after them, too. And now they're coming into Columbia, and we've got the salmon and steelhead issues there. And, now they're, you know, people kind of who come or are new to that part of the country forget that they are, they are iconic. Yeah. Uh, salmon and steelhead are icons in our, yeah. in our system and um, really don't appreciate northern pike coming in and ruining, right. uh, you know, millennia worth of evolution and so um they're getting after them and that that's a big issue i, I mean pike and wolves um uh, things like that are, are a huge issue wolves are the issue of the time absolutely they will define our time yeah. uh, because they're national uh, naturally uh uh repopulating washington they were introduced in in idaho and and uh wyoming and yellowstone but uh they're coming in naturally into right. washington and not allowed to do it well i'll tell you too, my experience with them having reported on it ad nauseum <laughs> um, until I was just blue in the face, but you're, you're um, going to stay blue for a while. It's not going away. I know it's not going away, but but one one of the things I, I hope happens with y'all is that we had like an eruption in the wolves when during the, I was I would say oh four oh five, the feds took an active role in reducing a certain super pack. Um, those wolves are now, and, and you know I'm not a biologist, and I don't play one on TV. But I do know that they're in groups of four and six now, and they haven't done that super PAC thing again. And that, that was the social tolerance where I live is probably zero. And the social tolerance for a pack of 17 galoomphing across your property was zero. Yeah. But four of them, five of them, uh, staying out of sight and mostly following the elk have that's where it's at right now. And I'm, like I said, I don't fly over and do this. This is just personal observation. Yeah. And, well, there's there's a lot to learn about them. The the one thing I think we have learned is that a lot of the 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 cry that we're uh, if you know if we hunt or trap them that we're going to do them in uh, is been proved false. I mean, um, we can we can manage these things and and get their numbers down yep. to, to what was promised uh, or at least close to it, and and have wolves yep. and and still have good game and. Uh, population and still have livestock that aren't getting eaten. Yep, that's alive. right. So we, we can have it all. We just got to get over that fact and understand that the Endangered Species Act wasn't a no hunting act. Right. It was a, it was a get them ready and then, then manage them like all other wildlife. Right. And, uh, once we get over that, once we get a certain groups to get over that and get out of court, uh, I think we'll get on and we'll be okay. Right. And we sort of did that. Um, I mean, I, it's, it's never, it never goes away. But do y'all have a wolf season? 
Well, no, you can't hunt. They're not at the management levels yet. Gotcha. And Oregon doesn't have a wolf season? No, not yet. Right. Do they close, have a – Close. It's close, yeah. We have them. And, uh, there's one guy, and I don't I don't know, know him personally, but he's retired forest service around my town. And he he's tar, he wants to hunt wolves. He's, he's he's into it, and he's got the snowmobile, and he goes out in the winter. And he's he killed one on purpose. Uh, the guy who owns a bar, his son, who's a really really good hunter, says he he hunted and hunted and hunted, and uh, and then got one on the way to hunting, <laughs> crossing uh, by uh, in outside the scapegoat wilderness. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so and he said, you know, and all the time I spent howling and all that stuff, it didn't work, but driving up there. You know, was successful. <laughs> yeah. Just be um, ready. But yeah, but they are difficult to hunt. Yeah, they're in. Um, one of the things that's happened around our place, I don't see them very. I see more grizzly bears than I see wolves. What well, they they just smart. They're so they're they have just figured so many things out so fast. And they learn quick. There's one rancher there who's gotten a couple that um just legally, you know, on on a permit, and they mess up because there's some reason they have to go past. They really like that place. And um and he's not he's he's not angry yeah he just takes takes the wolf he he doesn't want him on on in his cows and yeah he's yeah what wolf, some of the anger's gone one wolf biologist uh, told me how uh, was explaining how wolves learn their exper- experiential learning uh, uh, and they learn quickly but he said he saw one wolf kind of classically display it by a, a grizzly bear was on a kill and this wolf would come up. And uh, circle around his young wolf, and then uh, go up and nip the grizzly on the butt. <laughs> and he was fast enough to retreat. Yeah. But he 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 tested. Then he stood back, and the grizzly chased him for a little bit. And then he stood back and watched. And then he figured out he could figure out all of the his parameters. Yeah. Uh, and, right. Uh, right. But he did it. Uh, it was just. Just kept out of trouble. Yeah, and the, the penalty for messing up is just enormous. You yeah. know, they, they they talk about one of the things that also uh, I guess I got uh, convert you know converted over to being a, 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 a I like wolves. Okay, you know, and one of the things that got me there was uh, just how dangerous their lives are, and how packed with like adventure and risk and 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 stuff. You know, that one walked from they left somewhere up near us and walked a veil. Yeah. It was one that showed up at Chalice, Idaho, got run over on the highway. Right. She was on the move from somewhere up north Montana. One of our Washington wolves uh, got shot by a sheep uh, in a sheep problem uh, in central Montana. Right. Yeah, it went up and crossed the Kootenai River. Right, <laughs> right. And, and stuff like that. I mean, you just you can't help but go like, holy smokes, that's, that's, some, that's some, I'd like to be more like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, we had the one that came over from Idaho across the snake, came all the way across Oregon, down through the Cascades into California, California stuck yeah. around for a few months, somehow found a mate, yeah. brought it back up into the Cascades in Oregon. Started a pack. And started a pack. Right. Yeah. OR7. <laughs> OR7. OR7, exactly. yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yo, and, and so, do you, you are, how do you, where are you at on that? It's just like, world needs a few, can't stand a lot, or? You know, I I tend to think, and this applies to fish as well as wildlife, is that the human race has big, one of our biggest mistakes with management of, of critters is assuming that we know how right. things work. That right. We, that we knew better than God. The way, yeah. <laughs> right. The minute that we try, think we can fix things or change things to improve them is where we make Horrible, long-lasting mistakes. Right. Witness fish hatcheries and the impact right. of, of hatchery fish onto wild populations. Witness the our our desire to clean out all the log jams of the streams, right? And make it easier right. for fish to run up and down. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and to put same, out all the forest fires. Put out the forest right, fires. Right, and there's one. Slick off. I mean, we all grew up, or I did anyway, learning about the. Uh, the management mistakes in the Kaibab National right. Forest when we slicked off the uh, cougars mm-hmm. and suddenly the deer populations exploded. Right. Well, we've done this, you know, we've, I think we have done the same thing with, with wolves and uh, to the detriment of, of the ecosystem. Yeah. And, and I, the, some of the research that it was, it has been done at the Yellowstone to show 
uh, how the the impact of wolves on that ecosystem cascades down through elk into the habitat along right the where they're yarding areas. up, yeah, and and suddenly there's more willows along the right because they're not in there all day all year, and, yeah, and now because of the the more vegetation, there's more insects because there's more ed- insects, there's more fish, bigger fish, right. the, the streams become less wallowed out and right. deeper right you know so i think i think that bringing wolves back to a level in which we can accept is yeah. a good thing yeah. wherever we can right right i'd go along with that i mean I, it's it's really changed uh and and big time wolf advocates tell me i'm i'm uh live too long in ranching country right but the elk are and and there are the the burns of eighty eight have turned into dog hair, but the there's all these elk on private land way out on the grassland now. Right as we speak, they're calving out there, and not saying. And a a friend of mine who hunts all that is outfitter said, you know, there's century cows that have never been to the scapegoat wilderness, living today like they were born about the time the wolves really were were high. And that's a trappy country like that you wouldn't live there as an elk if you had if you could be out on the prairie where you came from, and where they are they do all these wolf behaviors out there they 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 deal with it no problem, but in the forest they have a lot harder time and so we for reasons for I associate with the the coming of the wolves they moved out onto the prairie, and they didn't go back, you know and so um there are elk in there and you can hunt it and there's great hunting. Well, but it ain't see, what it was. You can see some great wolf behavior in Yellowstone. I mean, uh, wolf elk interactions. Uh, I mean, it, if you for people who haven't been to, to Yellowstone and spent time in there watching with this, it, it is the there's no place in the world where you, you can observe. You know, this I have behavior. You haven't. No, really. you got to go. It. Uh, you can observe this stuff. Um, the wolf people are. You know, they they follow these wolves. So I was with some and uh, watched wolves coming out of the den, and then two wolves come out, and the wolf people said, "Look at, watch this, watch where they're going. They're going, and they such such and such place." Got in our cars, drove around, and waited. And there was a bunch of elk there. In kind of an open area, flat area. And pretty soon those elk started moving up onto the hillside into a rocky area mm-hmm. with a few trees, but but clearly in view. And it was a hillside and it was rocky. And they sensed those wolves coming. Yep. Those wolves coming over sensed the elk. Yep. The wolves come over and size things up. One of them comes to one spot. The other one goes up. And they start running around chasing the elk. The elk have got them baboozled in the rocks and and the wolves get not, the two wolves get nothing and another day they might get one but they totally uh was a behavior made because wolves were back yep. i've never seen in those like the 70s and 80s never saw wolves or elk go up into the rocks like right. that like bighorn sheep yep so yeah. and that's what hunters are finding right. we got to find hunt them just a little bit differently you did it's different yeah and there's um yeah where we're at i and I I bought a wolf tag one year and didn't I never saw one, and uh, part of that was uh, there were some running in a in an area that some friends of mine had to out were outfitting there, and they just didn't want them sanctuary and up you know like like the wolves you know if if you could harass them move them around show them some pressure, you know let's y'all y'all go somewhere else for a while you know and I, it's been over pretty positive. The, the the when y'all get to where you're at the the wolf season and all that stuff in Montana is pretty it's pretty positive it's leveled out somehow. Yeah. Um, I say that probably at my peril because I know there's still people furious about it. Oh, that, it's yeah. very polarizing and and that's the way it'll always be. So yeah, just yeah. So except that one of the, so really the reason I convened this thing was to talk about chucker hunting and the. Uh, which is something that I know so little about. That so I'm we've gonna... gone, we've gone from a, an animal that's a curse to a really, truly wicked critter. <laughs> truly wicked, which, which is a, which... <laughs> the, the chucker. <laughs> one of the true, one of the very, very few absolute success stories as an as a uh, a species that was brought in from outside uh-huh. that does not compete. With other species, God sakes, it eats cheat grass. It eats, <laughs> that, for that matter, yeah, it yeah. eats cheat grass. Does it really? <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's wow. a primary primary sprouting, diet. Good sprouting lord, green cheat grass. Uh-huh. If you have a burned hillside and 
you know, you'll know at one time they'll be there eating that sprouting green uh -huh. sea grass. Well, well, and are they good? To, uh, they good on the grill? Are oh, they good to eat? The they're best. Excellent. Yeah, are they? It's white meat, and yeah. it's a delicate flavor, and and they're a big bird. You know, it's right. a pound, a little bigger bit than a hun. Up, yeah, okay. twice as big. Twice as big yeah, as a hun. Bigger than a hun, and 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 it's just a, a wonderful bird to eat. Yeah, because that huns are my all time favorite. Of, of and that's just I've never shot chuckers, so yeah. You know. well, well, here's the thing: if you hurt yourself that bad to shoot a bird, you're gonna it's gonna want to taste it. pretty dang good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huns are wonderful in the when they flush; they usually only go a hundred yards, and right. where you can find them where they landed. Right. Chuckers are not like that. Chuckers hit and run. Hit and run. Yeah. So um, I've hunted behind your dogs one time, a long time ago, for sharp tails and pheasants. But what are y'all? What what's the, what's the dog of the choice? What's the choice of the dog for that game? Well, a pointing dog. I like a pointing dog for sure um, because they, uh, you know, it's not not flush and run uh, <laughs> on chuckers. It's tedious walking. Um, but uh, in terms of Dogs beyond that, uh, it's whatever you can keep up with. Um, yeah. Uh, Pat has um, has a German short hair, and it's a wonderful dog for it. Um, I have an English setter, and he gets up and goes, and he's broken my heart sometimes, mm -hmm. crushed me by going on point three hundred yards uphill. Straight up. Straight up. And, yeah. uh, but on the other hand, I, 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 I love what he does. So um, – uh, people, some people have pointers. I, I think they're a little extreme for um, uh, English pointers, a little extreme for um, Tucker Country, but some guys have the right dog. And, uh -huh. Does and it, it break them? Does it break them down? You, you want a dog that holds staunch, you know, rock hard staunch. Right, because you're not going to get a chance to. You might, know, might be five minutes right. before you get there. Right. Yeah, my my flushing lab would be the end of everything. He'd be up there hunting chuckers off the mountain, and I'd be way down the bottom. Well, if yeah. you know, I know people that hunt with labs very successfully. His son, they, but, they, but they have to keep them at heel. Keep them at heel, and, and using an electric collar to to like work the distance. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on how how well your dogs trained. Trained, right? Yeah. And uh, and I and Rich mentioned pointers. I had English pointers for twenty years, and and uh, they 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 never quit. You know, mm -hmm. they, they, they can go forever. But really, of the dogs that I had, only one of them was crafty enough and staunch enough to to uh, uh, to work out really well. Because yeah. if she goes on point four hundred yards away, they got to stay. You really got to have a way. And it, and it, special dogs can look at a bird in the eye and say, "It's not a good idea for you to to launch." You know? uh -huh. Uh -huh. But, but a lot of dogs aren't that crafty, and a lot of dogs. See the bird walking around in front of them, and they inch toward mm -hmm, them, inch, mm -hmm. and inch, and 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 chuckers don't take too many inches before they. Uh -huh. Some of the way times it's the way you set your dog up too. A hunter has to set his dog up right. If you're walking straight uphill, and your dog's up in front of you going uphill, and he goes on point, those chuckers are going to run uphill. Yeah. And but if you and so you can't let your dog get out too far. If you're doing that, if you're contouring, then it's a different thing. Yeah. But or if you're coming down, now your dog, if he goes on point, uh, you, know, you got up a hill draft, and he goes on point. Uh, those chuckers are not likely to do anything. Yeah. They're likely to be there. So you have more time. Your dog's going to be more successful. You're going to be more successful. Yeah. Right, Pat? Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's just that it's hard to always go downhill and chugger. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So you have to control your dog. So a they live there. Is, and, and I'm showing my ignorance now, although, I mean, I, I know the country. But I don't know. Like they, they, they sleep in the rocks, and they, they live in the, in mostly in the, in the scree and the talus. Well, not, 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 uh, not necessarily. I mean, they feed in the cheatgrass hillsides, and but not in the timber. They're not timber, but there's brush in, in draws. There's brush, yeah. and they'll, they'll go in there just like any bird and yeah. roost. And, and but they're very content being out on on a rocky ledge. Uh, in in uh, in fact, I was hunting in the winter this year and found where they got kind of into into little not caves but little hollows and uh -huh. the rocks out of the weather. I could see their tracks in there. I've absolutely seen them go into the into the rocks into little caves. A whole covey will pick out small caves and go in there. Cool. And one of the one of the ways that uh, I like to look up and find chuckers when you're first getting out of your rig and looking where am I going to go up this hill? Yeah. Is if you can see a, a Cooper's hawk or one of the other hawks that are stooping on them 
And I've actually seen a Cooper's hawk land in the rocks and try to dig a, a chucker out from underneath uh, gotcha. with, with his talons. Yeah. And so that's that's a kind of a nice thing because if you go on up there, those birds are still going to be in those caves. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, you haven't explained this for people who might not know about chucker hunting. Yeah, help me out. It man. is really one of the stupidest things a hunter would ever want to do. Uh-huh. I mean, there's perfectly flat cornfields for pheasants and rolling right. hills for sharp tails and you know and, and and stubble fields for huns. But you know, chuckers are up in the Scott awful place where you can walk a mile and never have one clean flat step. Right. Uh one clean step without rolling your ankle a little bit on a basalt right. rock. Or, and, and and you have places where you can't shoot because your dog's going to go off a ledge and get that retrieve, and, uh-huh. which I, I I won't go into it, but I have a dog that did, the best dog I ever had, went off a ledge and shattered his leg. I had to carry him over my back. Of my oh, own man. Out of the, out of the, it's, it's, I've, I know chucker hunters have died on slipping on uh, ice, uh, going along a basalt uh, outcropping and falling to their death. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's not for everybody. Somebody told me you had a T-shirt on yesterday that said, save the last shot for yourself. Smart, <laughs> Tell me that one. A, sm- a smart chucker hunter always saves the last shell for himself. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard country, and it, and it breaks people, and it breaks dogs. I was going to say, does it just wear a dog flat out, like well, pads and heels and any dog, knees? Any dog has trouble. A good dog, and you asked for breeds. Yeah. Um, I, there's an awful lot of good chucker breeds. But the main thing is the dog has to be in shape, fairly fairly light, as light as possible. Yep. And and it has to have trained on on rock. Right. So that its feet are tough. Because you can't treat you can't use the chemical treatments to toughen the dog's pads enough to get him out there on track. Uh-huh. And no matter how good the dog is, very few of them can go three full days. Yeah. Gotcha. And right. have your leatherman to pull out cactus spines. Out right, of right. <laughs> And um, so, what what country are we talking about mostly? So, you know, specifically, at least in Oregon, the the uh, the main drainages in uh, east of the Cascades all hold chucker. Yeah, and Canyonlands. Any, any, yeah, Canyonland, Broken Lands, Rim Rock. If you can find a, a place where there's uh, rock outcroppings and and larger rocks that has sagebrush. And has cheek grass, yeah. Then that that hill is worth climbing. Yeah, gotcha. It's just right from the get go. But probably our biggest uh, numbers are along the Snake River breaks. Probably yeah. both. In, is that BLM too? It's mo- almost all BLM, and that's one of the beauties of chucker hunting. Right. Because for those of us that don't really enjoy go- knocking on doors and asking for permission, chuckers are the 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 bird that's tied up close to public land. Yeah, the go to bird. Uh, and you were obsessed enough with them to write your book, uh, I, which I have a signed copy of. <laughs> yeah, and and I I I struggled with that for a while because there are relatively few chucker hunters. Yeah, um, and, t- and my research showed that there were less than a hundred thousand total yeah. in the United States, and that includes Hawaii because there's a popu- huntable population in uh-huh. Hawaii. But um, it was sort of labor and of love. And yeah. it was a recognition that there was at that time only one other chucker hunting book uh-huh. in existence. And so it's been pretty successful. It has gone into a couple printings and uh, is almost sold out of the second printing. So I'm real happy with it. It was a, a wonderful opportunity. And, and you know, you sit around some of these places where chucker hunters congregate and you listen. And and the stories can be incredible. I well, bet. it's yeah. called a chucker hunter's companion, but it, it's I, I think that's a mistitled. It should be uh, chucker hunting for knuckleheads, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> start start walking uphill and, and <laughs> something good will happen. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was the old the old motto of the magazine, the Mountain Gazette, which was a, a wild eclectic magazine out of Colorado. It said, "When in doubt." Go higher. Yeah. <laughs> one of the, one of the, uh, we have a series of sayings in one of the chapters of the Chucker Hunters book. And, and one of them is, one of my favorites is, uh, the shortest distance between two points is always up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so when, uh, when y'all, we were talking yesterday, on, um, there's some, some serious, uh, like rafting, Cast or, or raft and raft cast and, and blast, yeah, a raft and blast yeah. type type stuff in there, and that, that's what really fascinates me for 
Well, the it's Salmon just, River is quite well known for it yeah. um, in Idaho, um, going down and, and, and fishing for smallmouth bass and hunting chuckers or sealhead. Um, when you're doing the rafting trips through the main salmon, you know, you're talking a five-day commitment. Right. Um, and and, and the season is October? Uh, chucker hunting opens in September in okay. Idaho. And... Um, and so, but the steelhead aren't usually up there until October. So if you do it September, if you go early, you're taking advantage of birds probably being a little lower to the right. river because they're needing water. And then as you go later, they go a little higher. So you're going to have to work a little harder for chuckers maybe, but you've got a better chance of catching uh, steelhead. Yeah. And, uh, and do you, um, is the water level enough to actually travel the river at that time? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and it wouldn't be in a canoe. You'd need a raft. You'd need a raft. It's there's right. there's some class four rapids. Right. And, yeah. Gotcha. So the John Day in Oregon is is equal not equally good because there are far fewer chuckers, but but there are enough. They're a good huntable population. And, yeah. And and it's world class smallmouth bass. Gotcha. But, but there you you do have to watch the water level. It can get yeah. pretty low and pretty pretty bony. True. But could you take a canoe down that? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. I have. Yeah. I have. Yeah. 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 And the other thing about the the early season, of course, is snakes, and mm-hmm. that's always an issue with. When you're running dogs. Have you ever had a dog get bit? I never have. I've yeah. been with a guy whose dog was bitten and killed, actually. Yeah. And, uh, and that the, was The snake bite killed him? Yes. Wow. I vaccinate my dogs for rattlesnake. And does that work? Uh, the the Texas people tell me I've never had mine bitten, so I don't know. But yeah. uh, the, I don't. Uh, I learned that from the Texas hunters, and um, so I, do I do the same. I yeah. do the same. So and you every, do, yeah. And every year I take them to snake aversion training. Too. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And who does that? Well, the the uh, North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association. Chapter, I heard you talking about that yesterday. Yeah, the chapter in Portland okay. runs runs a class every year, and my dog is uh, you know one of the smarter hunting dogs I've ever been around. And and as soon as she goes to that area where the aversion training is is it, set up, she remembers that it's nothing good that's going to happen here. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> well that so i mean i i have my dog we we have prairie rattlers but the density is not that um so when you're talking about you you got really watched the snakes here is there, do you see one every every day and when it's hot you see well one every- number one i don't hunt chuckers when it's hot just for for mercy on my dog yeah so uh and i and i avoid chuck uh, snakes that way that so way, i yeah. tend to i tend to go grouse hunting early in the season yeah and and hunt a little mountain grouse and um not get too anxious about chuckers yeah. and then wait until it cools off because the water is a factor and you got to pack it for your dog in a lot right because you're up in the shale right, right. in the, sh- in the uh, shade basalt. Yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 so um i take it easy and then uh and the other nice thing about it once the pheasant season opens and big game season opens you got the chucker hunting to yourself yourselves right in on. a lot of places right it's true, and one of the benefits of chucker season in the western states is that typically they go from, you know, October, September through the end of January. But the problem is when you're hunting that late season, which I really love to do, uh-huh. yeah. you're you're also often fighting some pretty rough weather. And yeah. Last year I had to cancel the last three tr- hunting trips that I, that I had scheduled. Yeah, I was going to go with Pat, and there was uh, snow, and it was, uh, you know, post hole type snow conditions where uh if you try to get up there the walking would be almost impossible yeah. a bit dangerous yeah for sure i i hunted them in pretty good conditions and ended up glissading down on my butt in a couple of slopes yeah <laughs> yeah in uh yeah and it's worse i guess when that fr- that gravel's frozen underneath it you know yeah, and that with this, well, no, hey, oh, underneath the snow. Yeah, but, like when you can post hole, it's fine. It'll hold you. But when the gravel's frozen, you got like two or three inches on top. You get yeah. Just, if you have stuff on top of it, but if you just have cold conditions, that could be some of the easiest walking. Uh-huh. In fact, last year I hunted in, the, uh, in Washington several play times on very very cold conditions, um, but there was no snow on the windblown slopes, and uh, those rocks were frozen and they were held. So nice. you, you didn't yeah. you didn't roll down the <laughs> yeah. scree all the time. Yeah. You could walk. And it was actually pretty good. Right. So yeah, the ideal is you can walk up on those real cold conditions and the rocks will hold for you. And then in the afternoon when it melts a little bit, they're soft. And, and it's like walking downhill on, on marshmallows. It's holding The, the worst yeah, conditions gotcha. are uh, uh, freezing and then a sunny thaw so uh-huh. that you have uh, slick of mud. Right. I, in fact, I've had to just come right out of that country sometimes. Yeah. And just, yeah. 
So is your method to, to park and walk mostly if you're not on the raft trips? Yes. Uh, typically, I... A little bit closer right there. Oh, Are you sure? Typically, I, um, I, will, I, I hunt alone a lot. Yeah. And, and so I will park the car down low, and I will um, evaluate the conditions of the, the hillside above me. If I decide to go, I'll take off on a diagonal. Okay. And and chuckers in in this way are a little bit the same, a lot like like uh, fish that you might find in a lake. They they will find a, a level. Yep. You know, a, a, an elevation, and you may find them along that elevation all along the the hillside. So yeah. once you find them on the diagonal, you might want a side hill around the rest for a while. Yeah. But the thing about chuckers is is, is you can depend on them. As much as you can depend on chuckers for anything, you can depend on them to fly away from you. Yeah. You can depend on them to fly downhill, and you can depend on them to fly with the wind. Okay. Okay. So once you know two of those things, and you are a given, then you can try uh, to work into the wind. <laughs> with the and emphasis stuff? On, uh-huh. on trying to uh, set yourself up to have the best possible shot, or maybe two or three. Oh, uh-huh, gotcha. You know, he mentioned hunting alone. I hunt chuckers alone a lot, too. I never feel I'm like I'm really alone because I have my dog. Right. And, uh, he's, he's as good a buddy as I'll ever have. But um, I I carry a few things with me. I let not my wife know exactly where I am and when I expect to be home, where I parked. Yeah. And um, because you, you go up there and, and things can happen. Sure. Uh, things could happen. And it's not like uh, uh, anybody's going to come and dance up right. to get you uh, <laughs> because it's a tough spot. So I bet there's somebody up there that needs some help. When I when I'm alone, I I scale it back. I I scale back my speed. Yeah. Uh, I I watch my steps further. I think twice about walking on an outcropping. Uh, I just uh, I just scale it all back, kind of like right. a guy going into the wilderness. You know, you might you do something on a river where there's a helicopter coming for you any minute. Yeah. Uh, but if you're in the wilderness, you scale back your totally your yeah. your plan. Yeah. I remember uh, somebody who was an old rock climber friend of mine, his daddy had taught him like they jumped off a stump or something, you know, and there, and he said, you know, the truth is, is you could do that in a yard all day and it doesn't matter. But if you do that here, everybody's going to have to pack you out. So right. we're going to, we're going to do a different, you know, have just as much fun, but we're going to do it differently, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and along with that, when I, when I hunt alone, I always carry the ability to stay alive overnight. Yeah. Because it gets so cold up there almost right. any time of year that if you go up thinking it's you're on a quail hunt right. and you're going to make it back, then you may not make it back. Did you stuff a light bag in there? I do. I, yeah. have, a, I have a very light uh, uh, coat, waterproof coat that yep. I can pull out and put on. And, and I also I have taken to carry one of these uh, satellite... Uh, communication devices. Uh-huh. Not, reach. not a phone, but a but a. It's not a spot. like a spot. It's yeah. like that, like but a, spot. a little yeah. bit it's one step above that. Yeah, you know, where I can I can reach out and let people know that I'm in trouble. Yeah, and I do carry that. Um, but the main thing for me is the ability to to survive the night. Right. I want to be able to do a fire I with some to, food and some fire. You know, yeah. and, a, and not. Not just the coat, but a uh, a bivy sack. Right, sort that's of. what I always. I I have an old LL Bean bivy sack. That I, it must be eighteen years old. And it condenses real bad. Yeah. But it is it you go if I'm really going, it goes in that pack all the time because I've I've used it twice. Yep. In yep. in my life, I've spent the yeah, night and, in that. And thing at the and very minimum, you you need a windbreaker and a yep. and and a hat to cover your ears because you work up a sweat going up that stuff right. and then the weather changes and you're coming down and man it can change 30 yeah. 40 degrees yeah for sure it can get cold so what um what are y'all shooting for that in the early season i shoot a an old uh 20 gauge double okay and uh it's it's uh, side by side side by side it's uh it's uh modified and improved yeah and then in the late season when the birds are getting up quick and early, I shoot a 12-gauge side-by-side that's modified full. Gotcha. 
And is it, these are beater guns in case you take them down the rocks. <laughs> well, yeah. they might not have started that way. But right. After a few right. years of chucker hunting. I, I thought I'd market a chucker gun, gun that already has a dent in the ventilated <laughs> rib. And <laughs> the, the, butt, rest. the butt stock's already, uh, the plastic butt plate's already broken. Right. And, and mm. the, you know, some big gouges out of the out of the stock. I mean, that's what my chucker gun looks like. Yeah. Like what, what do you shoot? I have a Browning Satori. Uh-huh. Um, and that's just what I – it's not because I bought it to hunt chuckers. It was because the gun I have and the gun I had for yeah. many years. And Is it a 20 or a 12? Uh, I, I, if I did it again, I would do a 20, but it's a 12. Yeah. I, I'd love the 20, especially one where you can get, uh, you know, three-inch. Three-inch mags, I know. So then you can shoot – you can really shoot anything with right. that gun. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I traded off for the first computer I ever bought, an Apple II. I traded a 20-gauge Browning humpback that shot three inches. And I would, I, I would, I wished I just Kick had yourself, that thing yeah. back. Yeah, I just want it back all the time. I think about it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm going to do it sometime. I'm, this is, this is on. I'm, I mean, it's my thing now. I just want to see what it like. The guys I was working with in Idaho this year, um, we're doing that sagebrush restoration job with the BLM. Um, they, they hunt Salmon River country there, and I don't really know where, but they told me they would show me, and um. What that's like down the chalice corridor, or do y'all ever you get in there? And, uh, well, um, or you just got enough over where you are. Well, I don't go. I, I well, I'll hunt it all at one point or another. I'm and I, I, if I go down to that salmon river country, I usually float. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't. I, that's just farther than I need to go. Yeah, um, so. But you can hunt them even on the Columbia River, uh, you know, through Washington. There's places there where, the, and in the basin where there's spots, pockets of, of chuckers. Uh, um, even on Lake Roosevelt, there's a few of them. Uh huh. Um, and, and unfortunately, some of them are on the on the reservation side, so you can't hunt. Do they? Do you can't get a permit to hunt over there? Not. Nah, in on one reservation, you can. On the yeah. Colville Reservation, you can, and. Um, I don't know if they let you hunt truckers. I better not say that. I know they right. can hunt quail Get with you. a with a permit. What about what about y'all? What's your primary uh, country? You know, I try to I try to spread myself around. You yeah, know? and I hunt I hunt truckers quite quite often. I, I I try not to write all of my times down so my wife has no you know connection to it, but. Uh, to how much it, to how maybe, much meat is coming into the pantry yeah, versus how many days are <laughs> poor record keeping has its virtues <laughs> exactly and i may i may hunt uh between 20 and and 30 days of chuckers but when you start adding that onto bear and elk and deer it gets to be a little while yep but uh over that period of time i try to hunt across most of the drainages in the state i try to hunt the owyhee the malheur the snake yeah the shoots and the john day down into southeast or south uh, west oregon down towards silver lake it, there's just a lot of neat country and the thing that has always enthralled me about chucker hunting more than the actually shooting birds is just covering that ground. Yeah. Just covering the country and yeah. looking out there and looking 80 miles and thinking, you know, I, I, I could walk that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If I could see it, I'd eventually get there. <laughs> yeah, man. What, um, so in that Hawaii country, does it, you, there's quail down low? Yes. Yeah. Listen up in the draws. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's un- kind of le- relatively undependable, you know, uh-huh. when you get far away from agriculture. Uh-huh. But uh, but you betcha, you, you'll find them, and then they then they shock you because they move a little bit quicker. Yeah. than the chuckers. Gotcha. Do. Yeah, yeah. I went I went to Marsing one time and did a story on a coyote derby they had, and I was just quail everywhere. And I'd always, I actually, you know, I got down on the river, the Owyhee River, south of there. And I'd never been back. And even though it was like one of those places, you immediately go, "Boy, this here here's another one of the spots in this world where you gotta." Oh, that's a beautiful. You gotta, country. you know, here here it is. You found it. I mean, I hadn't been back. You that's know, a beautiful country. It was, it's it, tough country too. Right? Yeah, I bet. Well, Unforgiving yeah. country. The, yeah. the Owyhee drainage, the Owyhee Mountains south of Boise. And, yeah, and incredible. It yeah, is. it's a it's its own kind of beauty. I mm-hmm. know a lot of people from back east that. That even drive across it and say, "What in the world?" Right. It's what happened to it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What's so yeah. special about this? It's austere. Yeah, yeah, it for sure. That. Yeah. Well, I know y'all probably got stuff to move on to. Um, 
I've sure sure enjoyed this. I'm I'm gonna hit you up on it on a trip. Well, so I hope you'll join us because uh, yeah, uh, you know, Rich and I have been hunting together every year, every other year for a couple years now, and and uh, and we'd love to have you join us. Yeah, well, I'm always, I'm always looking for somebody to torture partners because an awful lot of people only hunt chuckers once. Right. <laughs> Well, I, I would. Uh, we might even pick this one up again. I, there's stuff. There's so much we didn't get to on that. Uh, on, on the on. I, what I, I'd like to talk about sometime is just like what the evolution of hunting and fishing over. We we three of us now. We've been at it a long time. Um, and what's different, you know, that's a topic for another day. Um, I, I guess in the people that pursue it, and it's not. And I don't know that it's all that different. I just like to get people's perspective because it's something I think about. I know my kids are hunting, um, and well, my daughter shot her first deer, but my son's like just like a hunter, and he's not as excited about ducks as I always was, but he does it, and he's you know he's a, they they want to hunt elk and deer, and he's obsessed with big mule deer, and it's and it's a pleasure because it's relaxing. You know, it's something you can always talk about. You, it's always there. But I was, um, I are in a good state for it. We are in a good part of the world, you know, in general. Did your children hunt? No, my daughters are, uh, they, they've biked across the country and they backpack and they speak two or three languages and right. they do different things. They're outdoor people. They're, they're outdoor people. I remember I followed some of that, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a it's it's an interesting. I think you know that that it's impre- it's interesting how youth get their impressions. You you try to be a role model as a parent, and uh, I think I was a pretty good one, and um, I think they would agree. But I'll never forget when my daughter had her sixth birthday. My oldest daughter, uh, I have my uh, quail mounts and my uh, caribou. Yeah. Alaska caribou mount and yeah. as you enter the house a pheasant uh, there's a story behind every one of them I just don't mount an animal to uh, you know there's a story behind every yeah. one of those animals that I decided to mount and anyway uh, she had a sleepover birthday party and, and invited some friends over and here comes a little girl cute little thing sixth, fifth grade I think sixth grade and she had her sleeping bag under one hand her little pink tw- uh, night bag and the yeah. other walks in the door and with a big smile on her face and then looked up slowly <laughs> until the caribou above and then over to the quail and the pheasant and then she looked at me and looked at my daughter and says this is like a museum of death wow <laughs> that was the end of hunting in my daughter's repertoire that's incredible <laughs> peer pressure hit <laughs> yeah right but then we're what we're working with is is absolutely the opposite and my my daughter was wanting to get a buck and i said wait well, let's just knock out a white-tailed doe and um, you know, and we did, and, and that's what we worked on for the first year. And she didn't get one, but her all her friends had private land access. Oh boy! And they're snapping these uh, pretty pretty impressive whitetail bucks, you know. Oh boy! And I, and she's like, "Oh, I really want to get a big buck." And then and like her, her brother's name is Harold, and she said, "I'd like to get something to make Harold, you know, jealous." <laughs> <laughs> Good for her. Good for yeah. Her. But uh, but yeah, we'll pick that up sometime. I, okay. I'm I'm hoping this uh, these conversations, you know, I, I'm doing them for a long time to come if if everything works out, and I'd like to get back with y'all. Sounds good. good. That'd be great. Yep. Maybe we can do one on the on the breaks of the snake. Yeah, that's what yeah. sounds good, man. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. See you. Thank you.